In this video, let's explore rare earth elements, a hot topic. No, not that hot topic. I'm talking about like piles of dirt whose availability is shutting down assembly plants and humbling US trade negotiations. Far too often, people are led to believe that this is an electric vehicle problem. It's not. It's a problem for all vehicles, electronic devices, jets, healthcare, all kinds of technology. So without much further ado, let's dig into it. What are rare earth elements? I'm going to do this video FAQ style. They're a group of 17 metallic elements that share similar chemical properties and are critical to enable modern technologies. These 17 elements include 15 lanthides, here they are on the periodic table, plus scandium and yttridium. Some of the most important ones are neodymium, dysporcium, terb, you know, you see the words. Light rare earth elements include elements with atomic numbers 57 through 63. These are generally more abundant in nature, easier to extract, and found in higher concentrations. Heavy rare earths with atomic numbers 64 to 71 plus eutridium, which despite having a lower atomic number, behaves chemically like the heavy rare earth elements. These are, yeah, you guessed it, much more rare, more difficult to extract and separate, and found in lower concentrations in deposits. What bugs me about recent reports is that many start talking about rare earth elements and then go on to talk about lithium, cobalt, nickel, things that go into lithium ion batteries. These are not rare earth elements. They're often called critical minerals, but that term does not have a universal definition. Apparently, coal is now also deemed a critical mineral by the new administration. Critical minerals are anything deemed important to economic or national security, and rare earths are a very specific subset of that. Lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite are not rare earths, but they're minerals in high demand for use in lithium ion batteries, although prices have plunged from their peak in 2022 to 23, China has put an export limit on graphite, but generally speaking, they've been happy to sell lithium ion battery materials to companies outside of China for final assembly. That's because they dominate the refining and processing of minerals for that industry too. What are rare earths used for? These elements have unique magnetic, luminescent, and electrochemical properties that make them essential for countless modern applications. You'll find them in smartphones for vibrating the motor and speakers, wind turbines, LED lights, computer hard drives, medical imaging equipment, defense systems like guided missiles and fighter jets, and electric vehicle motors, or just about any electric motor. The F-35 fighter, badass, right? It's estimated to contain over 900 pounds of rare earths in it, including scandium, which is used for aerospace alloys. Gadolinium is used when having an MRI as the contrasting agent that gets injected into your body, and terbium is used in semiconductors. This is not just an EV problem. Ford recently had a week-long shutdown at the plant that makes the Ford Explorer. That is not an electric vehicle. They shut it down reportedly due to a lack of magnets used in the anti-lock braking system. It was a temporary delay for a gas-powered vehicle, but it underscores the concern. Does China have all the deposits of rare earth elements? Good news? No, they don't have all the rare earth deposits. Bad news? They have a near monopoly on the separation, refining, and processing of those minerals. Despite their name, most rare earths aren't actually rare in terms of abundance in the earth's crust. They're called rare because they're typically very dispersed and difficult to extract in a way that is economically viable. According to the British Geological Survey, which you, know, you can't get much fancier than that, here's a map that they published with major deposits identified around the world. The different colors represent the different types of materials in which those rare earths are deposited in. Each material comes with its own complexity for processing and extracting them. Large dots represent active mining operations, and the small dots represent 
untapped deposits. In the U.S., MP Material operates in the Mountain Pass. They're a publicly traded company who received $45 million from the U.S. Department of Defense. Linus is also a public company that operates in Western Australia. They received $288 million to bring their production experience to the U.S. USA Rare Earths plans to mine in West Texas, turning that small dot into a large one. Otherwise, the U.S. could rely on Brazil, Burundi, Mozambique, or other Southeast Asia mines. But China is the problem. They do not have all the rare earth deposits, but they do control about 60% of the active mining of rare earths. But as you saw earlier, there are other places in the world that the U.S. could look to. More importantly, they have 85% of the processing capacity. Just like with lithium-ion batteries, it's not that they were just lucky to have mineral deposits under their feet. It's that their government had a long-term plan to dominate the separation, refining, and processing of rare earths. They had a plan, and they stuck to it. While in the U.S., we've fallen into a pattern of throwing out all the previous policies every four years. The budget bill currently making its way through Congress accelerates the phase out of Section 45X of the Inflation Reduction Act. That's being done to stick it to clean energy incentives, but it also accelerates the phase out of incentives for rare earth production in the U.S. Of course, you know that the U.S. is in a trade war with China and 184 other countries. To turn up the heat, exports of seven of the 17 rare earth elements from China have stopped. It's these seven in particular. Now, they require a special license from the Chinese government to export them out of the country, which sounds evil and controlling. But remember, the U.S. has its own export restrictions passed by various administrations to limit or ban certain technologies from going to China. China is restricting export to other countries, too, so that the U.S. doesn't just traffic in materials through some other country. We know we have to catch up, so how difficult is that going to be? You've seen the map. Rare earth deposits are located in many places around the world. The more difficult part of the supply chain to replicate is the separation and refining of rare earths. The process uses harsh chemicals like acids. Environmental challenges can and are being met by those who are starting, but right now, we just do not have the facilities built, and it can take time to perfect the processing so that it works efficiently. What's your favorite hobby? Uh, magnets. Mag okay, oh, what, like making magnets, collecting magnets? Playing with magnets? Just magnets. I'm if magnets are your thing, you'll need facilities to make them. A cohesive, consistent policy from the government is essential. China's near monopoly on rare earth element production was orchestrated by government policy, but it didn't happen overnight. They're already cheaper than any Western competitors, and when they decide to flood the market, the price drops, and that new competitor can't come anywhere close to making a return on their investment. The Chinese companies are propped up by the government, so they can sell at a loss. In 2024, MP Materials produced a record amount of rare earth oxides, and yet their revenue dropped year over year, and they lost money. The government needs policy to keep these companies growing, and they also need to stick to it beyond the next election cycle. You want to hear some history? Too bad. I'll end this video the way I love to start every video, with a bit of nerdy history. It's car-related, though. In the 1980s, both General Motors Research and Sumitomo Metals independently developed neodymium iron boron magnets. They had to settle some legal and patent disputes in how they manufacture. GM spun off their process as MagnaQuench, based in Indiana. Those magnets went into the GM Sunracer. I can remember some cordless power tools bragging about being powered by MagnaQuench. They even went into cruise missiles and guided bombs. America. Fuck yeah. In the mid-90s, an investment firm acquired the successful MagnaQuench. The new owners included Chinese interests. By the 2000s, they started manufacturing in China to reduce their costs and to get closer to the mines for raw materials. And thus, by the mid-2000s, the plants in Indiana were closed. Eventually, the remnants of MagnaQuench were acquired by Molly Corp., 
who also own the rights to the Mountain Pass mine in California. They eventually filed for bankruptcy. China was selling rare earths and magnets at below costs, making it impossible for a for-profit company in the U.S. Now it's MP Materials operating that same mine, and I'm hoping that they can stick around.